So, uh, well, thank you very much for having me, guys, first of all. It's super, such an honor to be here. Uh, to be part of a panel with these two guys here is incredible. Um, so a little bit more about myself. Um, I am somebody who is passionate about learning. I'm addicted to it, really. Um, and I started learning about the world, and I decided that I was going to commit myself to making sustainability mainstream because I felt that the sustainable world, the sustainable initiatives didn't have a good marketing company. And that's my background. Um, so I decided to start something called the Valhalla Movement with a group of superhero individuals who are all on their own, hero, own hero's journey as well. And uh, that's exactly what we're doing. We're doing it on the ground, so literally physically with our hands, planting trees, building eco-construction buildings, as well as online by changing the culture through online media, photo, video, um, websites, blogs, you know, just changing how people perceive uh, sustainability as a whole. And what about your catalyst moment? Oh, and my, uh, yeah, so my catalyst moment um, came when I, I had this business when I was an entre a young entrepreneur, and I had this idea to start this lounge. And I had it alone, everything was lined up, I had done a beautiful business plan, everything was going so great. And then the financial crisis hit. And I was like, man, what's going on? The, that wasn't a catalyst for me, right? I mean, this was something that was external. But at the exact same time, I learned where money came from. You know, I learned that we were basically living in a system of musical chairs and that there was more debt than there was money. And I couldn't understand it for the life of me. And I really felt compelled to change it or to do something about it. And the more problems I started to learn about, whether it be in documentaries or whatever, the more I started to realize that the answer was always sustainability. It was always consciousness. It was always being aware of something and then being a part of the, the actual solution. And so, you know, Valhalla is really not a protest. It's really about a solution. And that, that was the catalyst moment for me, is be a part of the solution, not complain about the problem, not just learn about the problem. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, so my name is Dane Adams. Um, I'm the founder of the Higher Purpose Project. And I guess the way to simplify that, it's a, it's a modern day Justice League. Um, so selfishly, I was able to bring in just a lot of amazing you know, heroes from my own personal network that I wanted to spend more time with. Uh, Mark is one of those people, you know, he's a doer. He's one of those people that Pat talked a little bit about in his talk that was willing to cross that threshold, you know, was willing to answer that call. And through that process, you know, you develop this intuition, this empathy, this ability to really connect with people. It's, it's not what you do, but it's just that opening and your willingness to have that courage to do that because that's what enables you to really build meaningful relationships. So. In my own personal life, um, I created an initiative in 2012 uh, called Mission Kilimanjaro. So we built an adaptive climbing system uh, for a kid that was born without arms and legs. Um, and so the, the mission wasn't about disability. It wasn't a you know, human humanitarian cause. We were trying to get people to dive inwards, to confront their fears, their limiting beliefs, because when you do that, just amazing things come into your awareness. You know, you start meeting people on a on a like-minded type of journey, and you start building these really amazing collaborations. And so uh, I had a vision in my corporate office um, in 2009. Uh, the callous kind of moment in my own personal life is uh, my brother, you know, is diagnosed as uh, bipolar and went through some difficult things. And, you know, the system uh, told him that he would be a victim, you know, the rest of his life. And uh, a girl I was dating at the time also went through some difficulties with depression, and she was a doctor, you know, so she was in a residency, and she was kind of, uh, took on the same type of mindset, you know, you know I'll just take these pills, I'll, I'll take these things, because they'll, uh, they'll cure, cure what I'm dealing with, you know, without really confronting the problem. Um, and so I knew to really get through to them on a really genuine basis, I had to take action, and I decided to do that with Kyle and her team. You know, we raised uh, close to 80 grand uh, in less than nine months, uh, we brought a f uh, two veterans with us. We brought a full film team. Um, and so the project ended up winning an ESPY. Um, so we got to meet just a lot of amazing people. And I was so thankful for all the individuals on my journey that kind of opened that world up to me, that I wanted to create an initiative 
that would uh, bring other people into that and give them a taste of what it's like to take that red pill and live aligned with that. Um, so it's, it's been quite the journey. Tough act to follow. <laughs> so my name is Ben. I uh, co-founded a company called Charisma on Command. And my story is I was born outside of Philadelphia. I went to business school 45 minutes from where I was born. And uh, through a mix of being competitive and being told this is what I was supposed to do, I ended up in investment banking. And uh, I know. And then to get away from that, because I wasn't happy there, I thought, oh, you know what I'll do? I'll change jobs to private equity because that'll be totally different. And uh, so I'm in my office in my suit and tie, and I'm working anywhere from 60 to literally 130 plus hours a week, which there's 168 hours in a week, so it's not a lot of time left for friends and family and hobbies and sleep. So uh, I'm doing this, and I stumble upon a book, I think has inspired a lot of entrepreneurs, called The 4-Hour Workweek, and his straw man just decimates me, right? It's the Ivy League guy that through somehow he doesn't know how, ends up sleeping under his desk, working a job he's not passionate about. And that was my chaos moment. I was like, holy crap. And so the book illuminated to me that that is not what I wanted my life story to be. And for the first time in my life, I started thinking, what do I want my life story to be? How do I want to be remembered? But beyond that, like, what do I want to be doing with my time? In a world where I could do anything, what would I do? It was literally the first time in my life I'd ever asked myself those questions. So I told the people I was working with that when my contract ran out, I was done. And every person at my firm had gone on to go to a business school, a hedge fund, or private equity. They like track for the last 10 years where they all go. And there's one person in the other column, and that's me. <laughs> and uh, I left my job. I moved to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I started my business. And that, after that catalyst moment, when I did that, my whole life changed. It became more fulfilling, happier, because for the first time I was doing something with Charisma on Command that I really cared about and I felt changed lives. Because to me, human relationships are everything, whether that's your mentors, your friends, your family, romantic. So to be able to change other people's lives in something that I really cared about was like a dream come true. So my catalyst moment was being the guy that Tim Ferriss destroys in his book. <laughs> and uh, it made me literally quit my job, start a business, and move countries. So it was a good moment for me. Awesome. Yeah, Catalyst Moments come in all shapes and forms. I Thank you. Um, so I don't know if you noticed, but uh, Dan is wearing a shirt that literally says hero on it. Mm -hmm. So I feel compelled to ask, actually, and, and continuing with this theme, um, what defines a hero? And I specifically you know, would love you to answer this. Um, how do you define a hero, and who is your hero, Dan? So th the way that I define a hero is someone that's just constantly willing you know, to get back up you know, and feel forward. I think a lot of people get caught up on the term like entrepreneur, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. But the thing is, is we really connect to people's vulnerabilities. We connect to you know, some of that darkness that we all experienced, you know, because over the course of the journey, just like Pat talked about um, in his talk, you know, we, we reached that point where we're like, oh, you know, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how this is going to happen. And we develop some type of motivation, whether it's a connection that we have, someone we love, an emotion that's driving us, that enables us to break through. And the hero is the person, a lot of times, where it feels like the world is, you know, bearing down on them, you know, and it feels like the uh, world's crumbling in certain ways. And by holding to your ideals, you're able to break through and create a new paradigm. And so I think the hero in a lot of ways is that person that is creating that new paradigm. Um, Tony's done it, and a lot of the things that he's done, I, I'm, I admire his work so much, and being able to kind of hold to his ideals and hold to his principles, because it's really tough. It's a tough process. But for me, the, the heroes that I've always looked up to uh, like in the movies when I was a kid, I loved Indiana Jones, you know, because Indiana Jones, like, he's constantly getting beat up throughout the whole movie, you know, and we're like, ah, oh. you know, and he's, he's, he constantly believes in his vision, you know, he laughs most of it off, he constantly gets back up, um, and, he, and he succeeds. But if he were just to go and, you know, get the grail and, and that was it, that would be a horrible movie, you know? And uh, so I think what really makes somebody a hero is just willing to be vulnerable willing to have the courage to kind of go into that unknown. 
Um, and through that, like, you develop like this elixir. And the elixir, a lot of times, isn't the thing that you succeed at. It's, it's the lessons that you learn, you know? It's that compassion and that awareness and just that ability to connect to people uh, that really serves as, as the greatest gift. So. Awesome, thanks. So I was chatting oh, across the clock. I really like you. Clap after everything. It's awesome. <laughs> I was chatting with Ben last night, and I asked him, you know, so tell me about your company. What does it do? And he said, you know, so basically, um, I ask people to give me money, and they sometimes pay me. <laughs> and uh, you were wondering what I was going to say. <laughs> but and I and I laughed at that, and then I thought, wow, you know, Ben really has confidence that he's an expert in what he does, and I really respect that. So. What I want to ask both you and Mark is um, for everybody, anybody who's out there trying to start their own thing and trying to, you know, have strength from within the self and, and teach people something, um, at what point did you uh, feel that you shifted to being an expert and how can you empower other people to feel that way? Yeah, sure. So, uh, honestly, when I first started the business, I knew a, a lot less than I know now about, like, human psychology, behavior science, NLP, all this stuff. Uh, but I, I knew that that's what I loved and that's what I read for fun and I've been doing a lot of personal development for myself. And so when I was thinking what would I like to do, dream job was kind of start Charisma on Command. So there's no really way to tell if you're qualified for that. There's no way to go like have tryouts. And so uh, I just started wearing it on my sleeve. So I started writing online and I started telling people that would ask me, you know, how do you, you know, can you carry yourself so well, whatever it was, I'd be like, oh, do you want help? I just started coaching and writing, and that was it, because I wanted to be a writer and a coach and a speaker. So, and I started, I started a meetup so I could be a speaker. Mm -hmm. So I literally was just like, all right, let's see if people like me doing this. And I put my writing wherever I could, on Reddit or Quora, anything, and just saw what the reception was. And as I started to get positive feedback, I started to kind of professionalize it, and it grew from there. So at first, it was more about just, I felt like I knew enough to help some people, and that's all you need. You just need to know more than the person you're helping to be able to be helped. So that was it. And so I just found the people that were looking for this and I offered to help. And as that grew, I turned it into a business. But that was my start. And I had imposter syndrome, by the way, for like the entire first year. Uh, it was not until maybe nine months in that I really felt like I had gotten to the point where I should be and could be doing this. So it definitely is hard at first to be like, yeah, you should be you know, hiring me to do this stuff. But if you're passionate about it and you're thinking about it, I'd say go do it because it's really, it can be life changing as long as you know enough to help someone else. Mm. Awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, um, so I said I'm addicted to learning, I'm addicted to knowledge and the path to learning anything, like riding a bike, starts with just getting a bike, number one, and number two, getting on it and riding it. I mean, everyone in this room and everyone in the world has a unique opportunity. An opportunity to introduce themselves to a stranger in whatever way they choose to introduce themselves as. So when it came down to sustainability, I knew nothing about that. I'm not an engineer. I didn't study anything like this. I studied marketing. I knew nothing about sustainability or off-the-grid living or solar panels or whatever it was, permaculture. But what I knew is that I was passionate about it. And what I knew is that the internet existed and that Google was there. And that was like the power of, of yeah, that's a higher power, seriously. We all have the world at our fingertips. And so you just need to value it. And then you have to have that imposter kind of feel, right? You have to fake it till you make it. So I would introduce myself as somebody who was an expert in sustainability. And slowly but surely, believe it or not, I, I became one. And now I can answer any question, well not any question, many <laughs> questions about sustainability, about what's going on in the world of sustainability, and you just, you immerse yourself completely into it mm -hmm. by just literally being what you say you want to be. And there is no faster way to learn to ride a bike than to just get on it and start riding. Awesome. Um, ben, what is your best advice for performing in high pressure moments? Okay. Got it. So, got it. That was a high pressure moment. Got it. Uh, so, yeah, so I get asked this question a lot because part of what we teach, it's charisma on command, and part of that is because the charisma part is kind of competence. It's the skill. It's like, what is your max ability to perform? The on command part is 
getting to your peak performance when you want on command because a lot of people they're up on a stage or at an interview or in front of a mentor tighten up and then later they walk away being like oh i should have said this that wasn't me at my best so we focus a lot on how do you get to the point where you can be clutch instead of feeling uncomfortable in those moments uh, i would say though you do have to start with some confidence so like no matter what i say around positive thinking if you've never swung a golf club or shot a basketball you can't just go visualize your way to the NBA. So there is a part of it that is like, get really good at whatever you're trying to do. And they've done science studies, psychology studies. If your perception of yourself is that you're skilled at it, in clutch moments, you'll perform better. And if your perception of yourself is that you're not skilled, you'll do worse. So you do have to focus on that confidence part. Now, if you are good, or you know, at least in any way above average at it, you should be able to get to when you want being at your best, whatever that means for you. Uh, I guess the shortest way to explain it is, uh, I've learned a lot from neuro-linguistic programming around going to emotional states, whether that's happiness or confidence. And so basically there's three things that make up any emotion you're feeling. It's what you're doing with your body, what you're focusing on, and the words you're using. So the quickest thing I could say is, if you want to feel amazing when you're on stage, right? Go to any time in your life ever when you were doing well in front of a group, doesn't have to be on stage, and start visualizing that. And we were talking earlier about the power of visualization. Go to that moment and start seeing yourself. And as you see yourself, start to stand however you were standing. And without anyone here knowing me, I can almost guarantee if you guys saw me on stage and I was like this, somewhere between sad and unconfident would be what you'd guess, right? Because we all go to the same body language. So assume the position of whatever it is that you want to be doing well at. The second thing is your focus. If I came up on this stage, I was like, oh man, like, what if I screw up? What if I stutter? Oh, I don't know these people. I can't see if they're laughing because there's lights and stuff. Like, my mind goes into that negative spiral. I'm sure we've all been there, right? But when you're really on, you don't focus on that. When Andre Agassi is out there playing tennis and killing it, he's not focusing on, oh, what happens if I trip? He's saying, this guy shouldn't even show up. What am I gonna do once I win? I'm awesome at this, right? His focus is positive. You can control your focus. Your brain will answer whatever questions you ask yourself. So if I find myself up on stage asking, oh, like, what if I say something stupid? Switch that to, how awesome is this? What if I change one person's life? You do that, you change your focus, you'll start to change how you feel. The third thing is word choice. If I say I'm petrified of public speaking, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm gonna hypnotize myself. I say that over and over and over. I'm not good with people. I'm not good with people. I'm not good with people. You're gonna start to believe it. But if you're like, I'm a teensy little bit nervous right now, but I'm really excited for this. It becomes true, you can self-hypnotize. So if you control your body language, your focus and your word choice, you can change your emotional state and you will be at whatever your peak is. And as you get practiced at it, it just gets easier and easier. So the first time might take you 10 minutes, visualizing, getting it. You do that every day, soon you just pop your shoulders back and it all comes to you. It becomes conditioned. Same way with Pavlov's dog, you ring the bell and he drools, except mine is like, I want to perform, get onto a, a body language where I feel good. And every single person here can do that. Whether it's your job, something athletic, it can be anything at all where your performance varies. If you control those three things, you will be at your best whenever you want. Awesome. So, I so basically we should all think really highly of ourselves all the time, which I think is great. But I do know that even with that, there's still gonna be moments of fear. And one of the things that I spoke with both of you about a little bit is, is are those moments of fear on your journey and how you overcome them. So if each of you could say a few words about that and, and give a little advice for, for everybody. I, mean, I, I think that's so important. You're never an expert at everything. If you pretend that you are, you're gonna fall very quickly. <laughs> um, I think how you can tell a true creator, they're very centered. You know, they have empathy, they're listeners. You know, they're constantly taking in information and they're constantly figuring out different ways to provide value. That's what, to me, like uh, a, a true knower does. And you don't try to just mask your insecurity and your fear, you, you express it. You know, you express like, oh, you know, I'm feeling a little bit off right now. People can connect with that. When you talk down to people, they just don't resonate with that and they tune out. And so I think, you know, the biggest thing is just whatever you do in this life, just understand that like it's all universal. 
doesn't matter what it is, it's the same process. So just, you know, completely own it and enjoy it. And it's all part of the journey, which is a fun, really fun part, part of your life. Like you're writing a story right now. You know, some, we're all at different chapters, but we have, you know, the opportunity to determine what that next chapter is going to be. And, you know, it's, it's an amazing gift to be in this world, you know, at this time. Mm. So I would say um, I answer fear with two questions. Um, and they're very particular in, in the order of the questions. The first question is, how do I really feel about this fear? Um, and why am I seeing it as a fear as opposed to an opportunity? Because opportunity generally tends to f happen in those moments where high pressure, high pressure situations, in those moments where we are actually fearful of something. And the second one is, does it really matter in the grand scheme of things? And what I mean by that is, I think about the size of the universe. Like I, I hone in from where I am at that moment, where I'm sitting on the stage, and all of you guys just think about, for 10 seconds, floating above this city, and then above the earth, and then out towards the sun, and then out into the universe. And think about how unimportant that fear can really be at that moment. Like, mm -hmm how trivial this can, can really be. So, and I just laugh and I'm like, wow, this is so completely stupid to be fearful of. So why not just own it? Why not just face it? Why not see again that opportunity as opposed to the fear? Awesome. Yeah, I, I just want to add just one more thing sure. to that. Like, it's all about perspective though too. You know, it's a lot of times when we take on these different things and we become fearful, it's like, oh, we're the only ones going through this. <laughs> and it's not like that at all. I mean, if you look at history, you look at some of the most significant people, you know, they've taken on tremendous things. And so, you know, for me, like I studied history in school and most people are like, oh, that's dumb, that's a waste of time. But for me, I got to study other people's lives and I got to kind of understand, you know, the risks that they took. I mean, you know, the risk that Tony took, you know, building this community and uh, the things that he's done, you know, it's, it's amazing. And, you know, for me, I watched a kid bear crawl to the top of Kilimanjaro with, without arms and legs, you know? And, you know, to have that type of perspective, that's what enables you to, to break through that difficult point that you experience. And so it's really important to have those type of stories that can really ground you um, in times where it feels like everything's up in the air. Awesome. Thank you. So we started this with, you know, talking about the self and finding strength from within, but I want to end it on a note more of, of bringing these movements and spreading them globally and spreading them to the people around us. So what I want to ask each of you is, uh, what are your plans for spreading your movements globally? This is a new journey for each of you. Um, and what are your plans for growth and how would you encourage someone else to take something that they've just become an expert in and spread it globally or, or to the people around them? So, um I have big plans, my, my major plans and, and everything that surrounds the Valhalla movement for me is all about empowering other people. And in fact, that's actually our mission, um, which is surrounding freedom culture, <laughs> the ability to encourage and empower individuals to spread their unique gifts to the world. Um, and with that, one of my gifts is marketing. One of my gifts is understanding how a website works or how to make a beautiful video or how to take beautiful pictures. Mm -hmm. And so I'm working on a, a platform called Greenseed, which is directly related to empowering social causes and sustainable initiatives. And it's through crowdsourcing those initiatives, so involving the people and allowing, number one, their ideas or their supporters to get behind it. And it's different than Kickstarter in the sense that, again, it's, it's focused on that niche, but it also includes allowing people to be part of a volunteer for a project or allowing somebody to donate their social reach to the project. Awesome. So um, it's something that's, that's coming out in, in fall. Um, you know, I always think about how can I empower other people? I always think about what is the number one thing that I can do today that will have the most amount of impact, not only on my life and my decisions, but on other people's lives mm -hmm. and enable other people to do it. And on, the online <laughs> world is, for me, uh, the place where, where I see that, that opportunity the most. Awesome, sounds great. <laughs> so I guess, um, you know, with global vision, I mean, it, it's sometimes uh, easy to kind of get a cop in this large scale vision, but it, it starts with your independent relationships. So in order for something to succeed on a large scale, it has to succeed on a small scale. Um, and so, you know, with the Higher Purpose Project, it's, it's a rather recent movement. It's been in existence for about two years. 
uh, we've led seven summits around different parts of the world. Um, and for me, like it, it's kind of a select group. You know, I wanted to bring together people that have already taken you know a few steps on their journey um, and have developed like that sense of empathy and compassion and can really connect. And so, um, in 2015, um, we're relaunching um, different parts of our platform. Um, and we'll have more of a global focus. We'll have uh, different summits in different parts of the world. Uh, we'll bring in some of the strongest members of our network. Um, and the reason, you know, the reason that we have this focus is we want to create this space where people can honestly collaborate and really show up as themselves. You know, really kind of um, feel uh, secure and comfortable in sharing the things that they're working on without feeling like that constant pull sometimes that we feel um, in entrepreneurship. You know, I know a lot of you guys have probably felt it. I, f I feel it a lot sometimes at these events. And um, I wanted to kind of change that demographic and really uh, kind of reinforce that belief that you know, we can collaborate and we can create these large scale visions, you know, together. Yeah, so for me, I think it starts with just continuing to write. So, uh, you know, we're launching a book in August and we're gonna keep writing online and just getting as much out there to help people as possible. We take questions from our tribe all the time on what do you want us to create and the hopes that that will just continue to grow and spread. Uh, the second is to keep speaking, finding more opportunities to speak in front of groups and to just spread what I teach. And then the third is with coaching, I think a good coach can help someone get so good at whatever it is that that person can then teach everything they've learned. So my ideal is every client that we graduate out should be able to go on and through their influence indirectly or directly, uh, they should be able to take everything that they learned from us and spread it. And in that way, you can just create all of these kind of offshoots of communities that are growing in the way that you'd want. So that's my mission really for helping spread what I do. Awesome, thank you so much guys. I know we're clapping groups, so let's do it. Thank you guys. <laughs>